The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And they are new every morning. And great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Good morning, church. Man, welcome to worship on a gorgeous day. We are so thankful that you have decided to join us, whether you're here with us in person or joining us online. It is a blessing to have you here. Just a few announcements as we get started this morning. First, I'm going to read a thank you letter from the Noble family. Dear church family, thank you for the prayers through our pregnancy and for prayers as we become became a family of five. We appreciate all the meals and everyone who checked in on us this past month. We are blessed to be part of such a wonderful church family and are thankful to raise our kids around such wonderful people. We can't wait to introduce Lainey to you, and I think they're prepared to do that this morning because Lainey is with them. That's a thank you from the Noble family. All right. Uh, you might notice that there is a special little bar on the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint presentation that you're looking at right now. And we are trying a new English to Spanish translation because we've been blessed to have a family that's starting to attend that uh, Spanish is their native language. They understand it best. They're still trying to catch up with some English. So we hope that you don't find it distracting, but we do want to honor them and try to help them by showing as much as possible uh, in their native language. And we're going to give this a try for a few weeks and see how it goes. Special shout out to Jeff Trapp who made all that technology happen because it doesn't happen like this. It takes a little bit more than a snap of the finger. So Jeff, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. The next practice for the Church of Christ softball team will be today at 1.30 at Poly Vista Park. That's next to Arrowhead, Arrowhead Elementary. On Sunday nights, we are looking for help to put together our worship service. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. And in that foyer area, there's a list there that you can sign up for um, to do the devotional. You might lead a couple of songs or be our prayer leader. Uh, men, young men, if you could do that, please sign up. I just looked at it before we walked in here. I think for tonight, there still might be the opportunity for you to lead prayers. That'd be awesome if you, somebody could fill that out before this evening. We want to keep some people uh, in mind in our prayers. Certainly our expecting moms, Carly, Macy, and Danella. Um, and we also want to keep the folks in mind that are battling cancer. Renee Monday, Joni Troutman, Scott Litton's stepfather Larry, uh, Dennis Franklin, and Laura Goats. Want to keep Tanya Johns in our prayer and I do prayers and I do have an update about Caleb Robson. Um, you know, he's been on our, our prayer list. You might have gotten some of the flock notes. Um, from a medical diagnosis, there still isn't anything solid. Um, I think he's seeing a doctor later on this week. Uh, Stacy and Caleb have made the decision that they are going to move back to Billings, though, from White Sulphur Springs. They will be moving next Saturday, and uh, you can probably expect to see the opportunity to help them get moved in when they get here, likely next Saturday afternoon. At this point, the best way that you can show them their love is with prayer. They're still trying to settle after uh, Caleb's medical event. Um, so if you want to send something of an encouragement text to Stacy, that would be fine. But we just want to make sure that they have some space to settle and to heal. We have somebody new with us. Uh, Tammy, is it is it Tedders? Tawny. Tawny Teeters, if you'll raise your hand. She is moving here from Kalispell, and uh, she is looking for help with childcare. She has three children on the younger side, and if you might be able to help with that, please see Tani. 
I got that one, that one, that one. All right, let's sing. No, call to worship. Then sing. So this is a time to, uh, where we have our call to worship, and the idea behind that is to help us to focus in and, and uh, just think about God and, and the encouragement we can be to other people around us. Um, the theme of, of what we're doing today is trying to uh, know God in a, in a better way. And I thought of this scripture to help us to kind of focus in on that and what God, uh, through his reminders, kind of brings us back into focus. And, and at that time in history, Isaiah brings back a people that were falling way back into focus of just how much God wants them to uh, revisit the relationship with him and, and get, to have a better knowledge of that. Um, it says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah and Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have, sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And God chastised them at the beginning, but then he calls them back um, as a reminder of his knowledge of them and how wonderful it is and how much he wants them to realize how, how good of a thing it is to, to come back into that understanding of him. In verse 18 it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are, like, they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. What an awesome God to be able to uh, know us in this way, to call us back and, and to want us to pour ourselves into that part of the relationship too. So let's say a prayer uh, together to start off with. Uh, Father, we're grateful for um, your tremendous grace. We thank you for your willingness to always seek us out and to um, your focus being on to help all of us um, that are gathered together here um, that we can um, realize what a wonderful thing it is to try to um, with all our ability to try to get to know you better. We understand you're, you already know us um, from top to bottom better than we know ourselves. And, and we appreciate the fact that you've given us the, the guidance and, and abilities and the revelations to be able to know you too. And, and we would ask this morning that you create that desire uh, in us during this time together. And we ask this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Morning, family. Great day to come and worship our God and do it together as saints in his kingdom here on earth. So as we praise, uh, why don't you stand with me for our first song. Come, let us all unite to sing God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises God is in his heart sweet music make and sing with us for Jesus sake our God is love God is love God is love come let us all unite to sing that God is love oh Tell to earth's remotest bound, God is love. In Christ we have redemption found, God is love. Our poor 
portion here. God is love. His promises are spirit's cheer. God is love. His This next song we've been practicing for about the last five weeks on Wednesday nights. We have a good time. We really enjoy that. So if this is new to you, it's because it is new to you. Uh, sing along and uh, we'll praise our God in this newer song. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so Oh, Lord God of Israel. 
your covenant of love. Oh, Lord, there is no God like you in heaven above. You keep your covenant of love, your covenant of love. Oh, Lord, there is no God like you in heaven above. Good morning. I repair our minds for the Lord's Supper. You know, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the nature of God and how that nature of God is seen in one way through Jesus Christ. And then on Wednesday nights, we've been investigating the concept of glorifying God and what does that look like for us? So I've come up with some verses to kind of follow along some of those thought lines. In John chapter 17, we see Jesus in the garden the night before he's crucified and he's praying to God. And this is what his prayer, part of what his prayer said. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who have, you have given me. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. You know, some of the hardest concepts that I've ever have had is understanding that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is also the creator of everything that we know, of everything that we see. He is also, in the very essence, equal to God. And yet, this man, the Son of God, he came to this earth. He walked on this earth. His feet were dirty. There were times he was hungry. There were times he was thirsty. He was in all ways equal to God, but in all ways equal to being a man. In Philippians chapter 2, it says it so very well. Verses 6 through 9, it says, Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. In John chapter 19, we, we see the crucifixion. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he came to this world to become our Savior, to become the ultimate sacrifice. Verses 28 says, Later, knowing that all had been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. What was finished? Well, it is finished in the fact that no longer was an endless sacrifice of animals required. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was the final sacrifice. Blood of Jesus takes away the sins of mankind. It is finished. The plan of salvation is now done. It is finished. The gospel, the good news, has now been fully written. And it is finished. But we are called to remember this. And we're called to remember this weekly, if daily, if not weekly. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, starting in verse 23, 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're to focus on Jesus. We are to know the sacrifice that he has made and that the gospel is now finished. And this memorial helps us to do that. Will you pray with me as we say a prayer for the bread? Lord, we are so thankful that we can gather together, that we can partake of this memorial together, that we can remember the sacrifice of your son, that he did come to this earth, that he did walk on this earth, that he was crucified, and he was the final sacrifice. Help us to do this in a manner that's pleasing unto you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Shall we pray? God, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to know that it represents the blood. It represents the life of Jesus. It represents a new covenant that is made to man through your son. That this new covenant washes our sins away. And through this new covenant, we can call you our heavenly father because of Jesus Christ. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. This morning in Bible class, Scott kind of finished the class by saying, what is the difference between happiness and joy? And there is a difference. One of the things I kind of want to point out is that there is a joy to giving. Sometimes it is happiness, but it is a joy to be able to give. And God loves a joyful, a joyful giver. I so much think of the, the widow who gave all she had and she was filled with joy. You know, I also enjoy this time so much seeing all the little ones come up and give. Giving back to God is a joy. And I pray we can give back to God with that joyful heart. You can give in many ways. There's a container in back. You can give online. You can mail. There is so many ways that we can give back to God with those Let's go with those words in mind. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. God, we are so thankful and filled with joy of the abundance of gifts that you have given to us. And God, I pray that we can give back to you with a humble heart that is full of joy, knowing that all that we have comes from you. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. The little ones can now come forward. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Any color, dark or light, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children.
children, all the children of the world. Any color, dark or light, they are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. Jesus rose for all the children, all the children of the world. Any color, dark or light, they are precious in his sight. Jesus rose for all the children of the world. Jesus lives for all the children, all the children of the world. Any color, dark or light, they are precious in his sight. Jesus lives for all the children of the world. All right, let's stand and sing our next song. And while we're standing, our children ages three years old through kindergarten can be dismissed downstairs for their time of worship. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. from Exodus 34, 5 through 7. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name, the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. I have the privilege of sitting close enough up front. I can see all of the kids, and this morning I whispered to my wife, it's a lot of kids. I was visiting with some neighbors of ours, um, and uh, a couple in their 90s, and they're saying, do, do you have, well, one thing they said is, Bill Gobin's still alive, uh, that's the farmers, and I said, yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> the other thing they said is, they asked, do you have anyone other than people with gray hair in your church? And I said, yeah, and they said, do you realize how blessed you are? And I said, yes. Parents, thank you for taking the time to bring your kids. I know sometimes having kids in service can just feel like a monkey show and you wonder why you come and why you show up. And if for nothing else, it's an encouragement to everyone else uh, having your kids here. So thank you for uh, doing the difficult thing and doing the challenging thing and having kids here. We're blessed um, by the families we have. Uh, so there's a, a, a story that is, is told about a lady who came at, for a co-worker's funeral and she kind of sat near the back and the preacher's up there and the preacher is talking about all of the the good things 
and the kind things and the generous things that this deceased person had done. At the end of the service, they still had an open casket and she walked up, she looked down at the casket, she looked over at the minister and said, hmm. And the minister said to her, is there anything wrong? Can I help you with anything? And she said, I just wanted to confirm that the person you were talking about was the person I knew because none of the things you said matched the person I knew. <laughs> We've probably all been in situations or in contexts where we've been asked, what is he like? Or what is she like? And, and we have to use a, a, just a few words and try our best to, to explain and describe what that person is like. Uh, maybe it's a Maybe it's a, a, a coworker um, who's going on a, a blind date, somebody you know, and they say, well, what is he like or what is she like? Uh, maybe it's somebody you're a reference for someone and, and, and they call you up and, and they ask you, what, are, what is he like, what is she like? Um, maybe it's a, somebody you, you know and they've got grown kids and you ask, what are they like? And so in, in the briefest terms possible, you have to explain and describe and show them what these people are like. What we want to explore this morning is that question regarding God. If somebody came up to you and said, tell me about God. What is he like? What would you say? How would you answer them? And, and maybe you'd get bonus points if you could find a scripture to point them to. And, and a lot of us grow up with all sorts of ideas and visions and, and, and concepts of God. Uh, there's a lady named Anne Lamont, and this is how she described the God of her youth, the God that she was introduced to. She said, he was a God that his children could talk to, could confide in, and trust. Unless his mood shifted suddenly, and he decided instead to blow up Sodom and Gomorrah. Does God ever wake up on the wrong side of the bed and take it out on people? And there are some people, their view and their vision of God is, is that God is, is moody and God has bad days and God might blow up on you. And so if, we were to, if someone were to ask me, what is God like? And specifically, is there, is there a Bible passage you could direct us to? Where I would take that person is to the text that we had read earlier that I'll read now for us. is Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for a thousand generations, forgiving inequity and transgressions and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but by visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So why this passage? Uh, I, I think this passage is, is, is kind of a, a, a fundamental, a foundational passage in, in giving us an idea of what God is like. And I think that there's three reasons why I see this as such an important passage. Um, the first is, that's God's description of himself. Uh, there's very few... Other passages, in fact, there may not even be any other, maybe that's homework for someone can track that down, where God says, here's what I'm like. Let me describe myself. So, so I'm going to give some elevation to any passage where God says, let me tell you about myself. Uh, the second reason why I think this is such a foundational passage is this is how God responds when Moses says, God, I want to know you. And so we have in Exodus chapter uh, 33, uh, 33 verse 13 Moses says now if I have found favor in your sight show me your ways so that I might know you and find favor in your sight Moses will then a few verses later in Exodus 33 18 he will say God show me your glory so Moses says I want to know you and in order to know you you need to show me your glory and these words that God has spoken that's God introducing himself that's God showing Moses his glory. The third reason why I think this is a, a good verse that kind of encapsulates what God is like is that it is one of the most repeated passages in the Bible. 23 times you'll have this passage either repeated or echoed in other places in the Bible. And all of them go back to this well of what God says to give a picture and a description of what God looks like. So what we're going to do this morning as we think about Exodus 34 and, and Exodus is we're going to talk about God in two ways. Uh, the first is uh, we're going to look at when God says these words 
And then we're going to look at what it is that God says. So the first task we have is, is there's an importance to know exactly where it is in his, Israel's story that God says these words. So I'm going to paint with really broad strokes in case you're unfamiliar with the book of Exodus. Exodus opens with the Israelites being in Egyptian slavery and captivity, and God responds to his people. Uh, he remembers the promises that he made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And so God shows up and he delivers his people from slavery. When they're delivered from slavery, the people will um, almost immediately, they go into the wilderness and the people begin grumbling and they begin complaining. And everything they grumbled about and everything that they complained, God provided. Food, water, all that they needed, God provided. They, can't, they come to Mount Sinai and God says he wants to make a special covenant with these people. Um, maybe with that, those screens, we'll just go ahead and turn those screens off. I notice people are getting distracted by it. We'll, 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 the show will go on, but if we can just, yeah, we'll just have that run on its own there. So God says, I want to build a covenant with you people. And, 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 and a part of that covenant is so there's going to be certain terms, things that people are supposed to do. That's what we know as the Ten, Ten Commandments. They give this kind of broad idea. And, and here's kind of how the Ten Commandments begin. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You shall make no gods, you shall make for yourself no idols, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven or on earth or that is beneath the earth or that is under the earth. So we're going to have this covenant, and here's one of the things don't, don't make idols, don't worship other gods. And when God says these things, then the people, this is Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, the people say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses then sprinkles blood, and this becomes the blood of the covenant, the people enter into a covenant and an agreement. And so Moses and God, they're up on the mountain, and they're talking away about certain things regarding the tabernacle. And the people say, you know, Moses has been gone an awfully long time, and things are getting kind of boring. And they go to Aaron, and they say, Aaron, build us a calf. So that we can worship it. And Aaron builds a calf and the people worship it. And it's a gross violation of the covenant. It's like finding out on your honeymoon that your spouse is being unfaithful during your honeymoon. And God is angry at the people. And there are warnings and there are threats of punishment. God says in Exodus 32, 33, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. And we're going to stop there in the story of Israel. See, all stories need to have a logical narrative flow. A happens, which causes B to happen. In our mind, A and B have to somehow connect and relate. So if I said A, John was hungry, and then B, John went and ate a burger, that doesn't need any explanation. Those things flow together. They make sense to us. But what if I told you, A, John ate such a big meal that his stomach was hurting, then B, John ate a burger. You'd have to raise your hand and say, wait, did I miss something? And you did miss something, because maybe what happened is John just had this great huge meal. He walks out front, and the girl he's been interested in since the second grade walks by and says, Hey, I'm grabbing a burger. You want to come with me? And now we know why John ate a burger, even though he was stuffed. That there must be some information missing if A doesn't equal B. And in the story of Israel, we have heard that on their honeymoon, they were unfaithful. But if we jump just a few verses ahead to get the B of that statement, Exodus 34, 10, then God said, I hereby make a covenant. God stayed in relationship with the people. And as you hear that, you, you have to raise your hand and say, how did that happen? How is that possible that they did that and that he did that, that he remained faithful to the people who remained unfaithful to him? And that's the answer that God gives when he describes what he is like. A God that is gracious and a God that is compassionate. And I want to push pause there on that. And I want us to fast forward to our perspective as New Testament Christians looking back at this and maybe some misperceptions we might have about Judaism and about faith in the Old Testament. 
There are passages like Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, where Paul says, We know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. And sometimes we come up with this, with this simple answer. We say, well, well, in the Old Testament, people earned a relationship with God. But in the New Testament, we are granted a relationship with God. In the Old Testament, everything was based on works. But in the New Testament, everything's based on grace. Well, as, as the story I just told you, did Israel earn a right relationship with God? Were they credited for the good works that they did to be in a right relationship with God? Grace does not begin in the New Testament. Grace is ever-present even in the Old Testament. Now, best-case scenario about what Paul might be talking about is a distortion of the faith that we find in the Old Testament. Is it possible that God saved someone by grace and they convinced themselves and they talked to other people like they were saved by works? Oh, absolutely. And you don't have to be an Old Testament Christian for that to be an issue. That's something that we recognize and see sometimes, that we can distort the reality of who God is. But in Israel's own story, had God not shown them mercy, there would not be an Israel. And so what is it that God said? And of course, that's what we have been reading, Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. And so there are these, these words about God's description about himself. And the very first word is, depending on your translation, either merciful or compassionate either merciful or compassionate. This is not a definition, but where you'll find this word show up is when one person positively responds to another who is in pain or in need. You'll find compassion. You'll, you'll see it in cases where one person responds to someone else who is in need. There's a story in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 about two women who are arguing over a baby, and they go to Solomon, and... and, and uh, who knows who the real mother is? And so Psalm says, okay, let's just do this. Cut the baby in half. You can have half. You can have half. And the one lady says, yeah, sounds like a good plan. Here's what the other lady says. This is 1 Kings 3, 26. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because compassion for her son burned within her, please, my Lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. Compassion means... I'm going to do something that's harder for me because I know it's better for you. And because you're in a situation where you have need, because you're in a situation where you're facing pain, I will experience the pain, in that case, the pain of separation from my own child, because I know it's what's best and what's right. And it's that very language that God, as he begins to kind of reach out his hand, say, nice to meet you, the first thing he says is, I am gracious. I am merciful and compassionate. The second thing that God wants Moses to know about himself is that he is gracious. The word gracious, where you will find that word show up, is when a stronger party is generous to a weaker party. It shows up in a context where a person would say, look, I I I've got nothing to barter with here. I've got nothing to trade. I've got no point of negotiation, and I'm going to ask you for something, and there is absolutely nothing I can give to incentivize you to help me. And if the person does choose to help somebody in that case, that would be called being gracious. And God, as he introduces himself, he says that he is a gracious God. And these two words come together, these concepts of God being both merciful and gracious, the word gracious is going to appear 13 times in, in the Old Testament, and 11 of those times it's going to be paired together with this first concept of God being merciful. And I think what we see there is, what is the first thought that comes to mind when you think about God? What are the first words that come to mind? What God wants the first words to come to our mind is that He is merciful and that He is gracious. And God pairs those words, and those words are used over and over in the Old Testament. We're going to skip a descriptor. We're going to come back to it and come to the description of the word being abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This word steadfast love is probably one of the kind of the, the, the weightiest, most complex terms in the, in the Bible, but it's really fun to say in Hebrew. I think we've talked about this before. Some people say it's hesed, but it's really good if you get a little phlegm going to make it chesed. 
That's God's steadfast love. It's going to be translated a lot of different ways in our English Bibles. Kindness, loving kindness, love, steadfast love, unfailing love, loyalty. And that word's put together with your translation may say faithfulness. It may say something about being truthful. It's a word about firmness and certainty and dependability and truth. So we're going to find these words together would be in any context where one is being faithful or true to the requirements or commitments of covenantal love. Maybe the best way for us to think about this is in the context of a healthy marriage. A marriage begins with a covenant, begins with promises, doesn't it? I promise to love, to honor, to cherish. And then we say in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. And here's the thing about covenants and, 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 and the thing about these vows. They're really easy to make, but sometimes really hard to keep. And what God is saying is, I am a God who keeps my covenantal promises, and I am a God who is faithful to the promises I make. You never have to lay awake at night wondering, is he going to love me? Is he going to care for me? This is a God who is faithful to the promises that he makes, which is so different than what we might find and encounter in our lives. So we have these kind of four terms, merciful, gracious, abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness. And they introduce us to a kind of a picture of God. But even as we introduce those pictures, I'm sure somebody's saying, yeah, 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 but Craig, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, that doesn't sound like a God who would do the kinds of things that we're talking about here or that are being described here. Or somebody would say, D do you realize that the wrath of God is talked about 600 times in the Old Testament? So why isn't the wrath of God the dominant image of God? And when people get to this intersection, it seems like there's kind of three pathways that people will take when it comes to the wrath of God and to the love of God. One pathway that some might take is that they will make the wrath of God God's dominant attribute. They'll say, I don't know how to fit all of this love stuff into God, this graciousness into God, this compassionate stuff into God. And in fact, if you start believing God's like that, you're probably going to take advantage of him. So I'd rather have you be afraid and terrified and petrified of God. So anytime I have a chance to speak about God, I'm going to talk about his wrath to the exclusion of any of these other aspects. And that's one pathway that people will take when they come to this crossroads when it comes to love and wrath. The other is some people do the exact opposite. They'll say, I don't know, I don't know how to, to, to fit the wrath of God in with the love of God, so you know what we're going to do? We're going to just sit, set aside the wrath of God, and let's just talk about the love of God. God is like the grandfather that no matter what happens, you know, he's going to give you a hug, and he's going to give you a big, you know, allowance, and he's going to just do whatever you want him to do no matter what happens. And that's another pathway that some take. But the pathway that's taken in Exodus 34 is to say these two things are together, and they both equally give us the right picture of God. So let's look at these aspects of the anger and punishment that are associated with God. The first language we have here that talks about that aspect is that God is slow to anger. In acknowledging his anger, God seems to want to differentiate it from human anger. Think about the last time you got angry. The, the terms we use with anger tend to talk about their quickness. I lost my temper as it quickly got away from me. I, 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 I blew my top off, and I didn't have time to kind of rein it all in. And so there's a quickness to our love. Our, our anger. And yet for God there is a slowness, which indicates there is intention. There is purpose to the anger of God. We lose control, but God never loses control. God never has to come back and say, I'm sorry I lost my temper, because he is a God who is slow to anger. You might say, why does he even have to get angry at all? Why is there any anger in God? God is angry because of what sin does. First of all, sin is an affront in the relationship to God. Sin is disrespect to God. Sin is rebellion against God. And it, and it drives a wedge between that relationship that's so important to God. The other thing is that sin is a destroyer of the things that are good in God's creation. So if you were to think about sin like a, like a, a, a virus that has lethal side effects... And you know, everywhere where that virus goes, it has the potential to kill the people it comes in contact with. What does a loving person do? 
Does a loving person say, well, I, I mean, I don't want to offend you to just mention like this person might have this, you know, this lethal disease and if they cough on you, they might kill you. I mean, that's, the, you know, that's not my right to say anything about that. I love you and so I'm not going to challenge you at all. If we think about sin like a virus, we realize the most loving thing is the action has to be taken. Things are being destroyed. And so God does get angry, but he is slow to anger. As we think about God's anger, there's, there's some helpful insights by a guy named John Mark Comer. Um, there, 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 there's a beautiful slide I could show you, so email me if you want to, you know, if you want to see all of this laid out. But there are these different elements of God's wrath, of God's anger, and, 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 and the first is, this, is, is God's active present and future wrath. God's active wrath is when God, in that moment decides to deal with sin by a, an intense outpouring of anger. And do we find that in the Bible? Yes. Now here's what's really interesting. Those are the things we remember most. Nadab and Abihu, we remember that. Sodom and Gomorrah, we remember that. John Mark Comer says that of, of all the expressions of God's anger and wrath, this is the least frequently we ever see how it's expressed is in the moment God actively doing it. Then there is future God's act of wrath, which is what would be called the day of the Lord. There's this understanding and this realization that there's, there's going to come a time when God is going to actively pour out His wrath on the day of judgment. God doesn't always do it today, but in the future, God's wrath will be poured out. And then on the, on the other side is God's passive wrath. And what's God's passive wrath is this, is when God says, you know what? I'm going to remove myself from the situation and let you bear the fruit of your own labor. And so a person begins making bad decisions, and they begin to suffer in light of those decisions. God is passively allowing that to happen. It can happen in, in the present. It can happen in the future. Uh, death is one thing that we'll all experience. That is a consequence of sin. But God has just simply allowed death to continue to have its reign in this world until he ends all of those things. But so God's anger does play an important role. But even as we talk about God, God's anger, we remember that it's slow. So the things that Exodus 34 wants to emphasize about God's anger is, number one, it's length. How long does it take for God to get angry? And, and if you imagine this being kind of a, a, a line that shows us, like, how quickly do humans get angry? We're right here. And, and of, the, of the foreign gods that people talked about, they're right there too. I mean, you know, one of these, one of these uh, pagan gods like, like, like Baal, uh, he has a bad day and, and you need to watch out. You have to be on your tiptoes. When God gets angry, what Exodus 34 is saying, God slowed angry, anger. And his anger is going to come a lot later. John Mark Comer says it this way. He says, yeah, you can make God angry. It's just going to take a lot of work. And unfortunately, there are people who are set on the wrath of God. The other thing that we notice that, that Exodus 34 is trying to say about God is how long do the punishments and the consequences of that sin last? For us as humans and for the other gods, it lasts a really long time. How long am I going to hold on to this grudge? How long will it be before I forgive you? Well, I don't know if I'll ever forgive you. But notice what Exodus 34 says about God's love. He says, God's love will last to the thousandth generation. But what about the punishment? How long does that last to the third or fourth generation? Now, that's likely, I think, talking about God's passive allowance of the fact that if grandma and grandpa do something terrible, there's going to be some consequences for children. But God's going to ensure that those consequences do not go on forever to future generations. But what will go on to future generations? God's love goes on to the thousandth generation. There is an expiration date on God's wrath. His sin, his punishment of sin takes its time, and when it comes, it does not last the length that we would expect it to last. God is a good and a gracious God. If I were to summarize the sermon this morning in one sentence or two, which most of you say, well, if you could have just summarized a sentence or two, we would have selected that option. That's why we didn't vote if we wanted just the sentence. But this would be, this is what C.S. Lewis says. God does not love you because you are good. God loves you because God is good. How did Israel end up where Israel ended up? Was it because she was good? She was faithful? She did everything God told her to do? No! 
The only answer is because God is gracious and compassionate and long-suffering. He endures with his love. And what if you were to tell your story about how it is that you are in relationship with God? Would you say it's because you were so good? Or would you say it's because God is good? What Scripture tells us and teaches us is about the goodness of God. I was at a preacher's retreat this week. You know, all sorts of fun, exciting things that we talk about when we're together. And one of the things that came up was application in sermons. Sermons need to be applicable. And I thought about sermons and applications, and, and, and I wondered, what do you mean by application? Because if you mean by application an action I have to take to make this happen, that's really, really hard to do with something that's called the good news. Because the good news is you've opened a newspaper and you've read and said, something happened outside and apart from you that gives you life. I mean, if, 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 if the government says, we realize our tax rates were all wrong, we're sending everyone new checks, that's good news. And, 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 and if somebody gets up and does an hour lecture on what you have to do to get the tax return, the answer is, you just have to get the mail. Because it's coming. It's good news. But if application is in terms of how does this impact my life, there's a recognition that God's goodness has dramatic application to our lives. How do I live differently because God is good? If, if I believe God is an angry, wrathful God, do you think I'm going to live differently than if I recognize that God is the God who is professed in Scripture? When Peter preached the first gospel sermon in Acts 2, he gave us good news. He, he talked about all that Christ accomplished. And do you know what he did at the end of that sermon? He sat down. Until somebody said, hey, 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 Peter, what shall we do? Had nobody asked what do we do, if people weren't cut to the heart, if people weren't convicted by the message of Jesus, then there was nothing for them to do. But at the moment they were convicted, and then they could come and say, okay, what's next? And what did Peter say? Repent and be baptized, each and every one of you. God's goodness calls for a different response from each of us. In just a moment, we're going to stand up and, and sing. So for some of us, God's goodness is going to call for the response to sing of His goodness and of His glory, to worship Him and to thank Him, and to serve Him and to love Him. For others of you, the response to God's goodness is to say, man, if God's that good, I want to live for that God, I want to know that God, I want to love that God, I want to serve that God. And then that's where the invitation comes to give one's self fully and completely to that God in the waters of baptism. That's why as we end the sermon, we invite people to come to the back because what God is calling you to do may be very different where you are on the stage of life. But so just in just a moment, you will have an opportunity to respond in any way. But before we do that, I'd like to offer a word of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In light of our sermon, just remember how much of a blessing it is that you know when God turns his face towards you, it's to give you peace. He doesn't turn his face towards you to hurt you, to harm you, to punish you. No, his turning towards you is a sign of his own graciousness. And we know that we go from here with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ with the love of God and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. If you don't respond in any way, I'll be in the back. Some of our shepherds will be back there. I invite you to come to the back while we stand and sing this song together. Let's stand. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. The glory revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered.
Lord our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. with me in prayers we're dismissed father god we are truly thankful for this day words would fall so short if we tried to pick up and and say things that uh, truly equaled who you are the glory that you have so father maybe it's best just to pray like jesus taught us father hallowed be your name and father we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we know that that takes on an accountability factor for each of us to live a life that would be pleasing to you. And so, Father, I, I thank you for all of the people who are here this morning. As, as Craig <laughs> talked about this morning, I am really, really thankful for all of the parents who bring their children. Man, when I hear those cries, Lord, you know what I say to you. Thank you. <laughs> When I, when I hear the rustle of those kids, I say thank you. And at the same time, Father, I thank you for the more mature audience with us that might struggle even to walk up the aisle and to sit. They are the encouragement that we see year after year of wanting to worship you in community. And I am thankful, Father, for those that struggle to be in crowds whose preference would, would, would not be together, to be together in a room with other people, and yet here they are. I say thank you, Lord. And Father, as we think about the type of life that uh, we want to lead today and tomorrow, may, may we set it in our minds that uh, when we leave this earth and words are said about us, may they be words that you would find pleasing, but may they also represent the way that we lived our lives. We want to be a blessing to you, so we pray that your spirit would guide us, that your word would guide us, that your church community would encourage each of us to live a life that would be pleasing. Father, we know that you have blessed us, but we pray for your wisdom and your ways to be a blessing to you. We thank you for our Savior, your Son, Jesus, and in his name we do pray. Amen.